Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. Alright, hello my friends and welcome to another weekly wrap up and in this case it is two times the fun because this is for basically the whole first two weeks of September. We have 17 books that I read in the last, uh, well, 12 days basically and boy, it is a ride. There are so many to talk about. A bunch of new releases, some upcoming releases, um, rereading some old favorites. The Phantom Romance Readathon started on the first, so I've been doing reading for that. Go Team, Opera Singer, I think we're doing amazing. And we have a lot to get to today. So we do have a bit of business up front, and then we're going to get right into it because we all know this is going to be an over an hour. Like it just is, I can tell already. So I got my coffee, got my notes, got my books. It's time to go here. So first off, I did have an Etsy update and I'm so proud of it. It's so beautiful. It is my spooky designs. Um, so we have some really fun book sleeve designs. Of course, I love this metallic pumpkin so much. I also have the keychains in this design. Um, it's so beautiful. I love these I, pink dancing skeletons. This is the laptop sleeve. I still have one of these left. Although this time I put it so that the pouch is on this side so you can use it for a laptop or just as a big pouch for whatever you want to put in it. Um, there's these cute little designs here. So much fun stuff. So as always, there is a 10% off coupon listed down below, which I did have to change. So if you're used to using the Book Refuge 10, it's now just the Book Refuge to get 10% off. So make sure you check that out. If you are a Patreon or a patron on Patreon, you also get free shipping. So go check that out. Um, you can find the code there. Obviously, I'm not going to say it here because it's for patrons only. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Those will be the designs that I have for the spooky season. I have some sitting up here behind me as well, which is exciting. I loved making these ones. They're so cute. Then we do have three new patrons to welcome to supporting the channel here. There is a Bene. I think that's how you pronounce your name. What a beautiful name that is. There is a Mathilda Louise and there is Celine. Um, they are all new supporters to the channel. So thank you all so much. Every one of you helps, you know, every person helps me so much. Um, and I'm just very thankful because I wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. Absolutely not. So let's get into this huge stack of books we have. Um, I know I say that I ramble too much and I know you guys don't agree or you wouldn't be here. Um, but there are some of these that because I've read so many in the last two weeks, I don't even fully remember them that well. So I will be relying pretty heavily on my notes. You know, that's part of the reason why I also do weekly wrap ups is I have a pretty good memory. I catch a lot of things. I remember a lot of things very well, but the finer details of books start to go very quickly. And that's why I have to take lots of notes. And that's why I don't wait until the end of the month to talk about books because it would be all gone by then. Like it would just, it would be all gone by then. So the first book that I listened to here was My Darling Bride by Ilsa Mad Mills. Um, I listened to this one because I do have an arc of My Darling Jane, which is coming in October. And this book was available for read and listen on Amazon, which it's a little different than Audible Plus, but in my opinion, it's like kind of the same. But I believe even if you don't have Audible Plus, you can still get a read and listen because if you have Audible, even if you don't have like Audible Plus, and you download the ebook, the audiobook will also download for you. But anyway, this one, My Darling Bride, had quite the setup. This is Emmy and Graham, and Emmy happens to be kind of a woman on the run from an abusive, uh, abusive boyfriend. And she is from a family that dealt with a lot of domestic abuse, and so she's very disappointed in herself that she finds herself in that position at the beginning of this book and she's actually kind of like uh so she's on the run and she runs into Graham at this like small kind of motel in the middle of nowhere um and he is actually a famous footballer who had a near-death experience on the field and after his near-death experience he takes this little vacation and he is trying to rediscover himself and as I said he runs into her um 
at this little motel and he like pre she pretends they like pretend to be dating to kind of try and scare away her ex-boyfriend um and she ends up through some shenanigans she actually ends up stealing graham's vehicle and she plans to like get it back to him but the place that she leaves it she leaves the keys in a place that someone else is able to find it and then they steal his vehicle and total it. And it was a very expensive vehicle too. So he's a little pissed about that. But he ends up finding who she is and he ends up tracking her down. And again, there are a lot of like stipulations within this one, but he, the family that he's a part of is a very wealthy family. Besides him being a footballer and making lots of money, he has a brother who is gay. And because his brother is gay, he's been cut out of the family will basically. Um, him having a male partner, isn't good enough for his family and so graham kind of wants to shove it to his family um in that regards and so his plan uh that he comes up with is to actually get married receive the inheritance but then give the inheritance to his brother because he doesn't need the money and for whatever reason he decides to blackmail the woman who you know he could sue for the damage to his vehicle um and instead he kind of forces her to marry him oh and there's also the little bit of he buys the bookstore that she works at that's about to go out of business so you could see there's just so many layers going on in this book and i ended up not really caring for this too much i gave it three and a half stars it was a two and a half on the spice scale it was incredibly like frustrating slow burn there was so much miscommunication between these characters and also if i didn't have notes about this i would barely remember it like even when i was filling out my form it was very hard to remember it this wasn't very memorable to me it was narrated by sebastian york and savannah peachwood that was nice at least i love those two but it just it wasn't that great and it doesn't make me super excited for the one that i have an arc for i will just say that Okay, next up, I had an arc of Milo by E.L. Lewis, and this was an author I'd never heard of before, um, but I got this from Hambright PR is the name of the PR. Yeah, I gave this one a try, and I thought this book was pretty interesting. So this is a mafia romance, and this is Milo, of course, and Chiara, and Chiara ends up seeing, I think it's a robbery again memories fading a little bit she sees something happen that she shouldn't and she actually understands the language that they're speaking i think it's russian that they're speaking again i don't know she knows lots of languages and so she overhears what's happening and she sees something she shouldn't and instead of being killed she gets roped into a deal with this mafia boss that she will be a translator for him um and so he ends up wanting to keep her for that and yeah so he's like you'll either work for me or i'm gonna kill you Kind of the setup of this um i remember feeling like this was like way too long like it could have been a lot well not that it should have been a lot shorter but i just i felt like they were resolved to be together pretty soon and then some of the conflict that came up just didn't balance well for me and i was kind of like mm, eh, by the end of it like it just felt meh about it it was an arc though i rounded it up to four it was a four on the spice scale I did think that the scenario was kind of unique, but also at the same time, there are plenty of mafia bosses that have blackmailed a woman into something, so it wasn't that unique. I don't know. Eh, eh. You decide for yourself with that one. Okay, next up, there was The Fiery Cross, which of course is a reread. I am doing an Outlander read-along this year, which it will be spilling into next year because I give people about two months to read each book. And there's not too many people left. I, I, I know that it would fall off. Uh, people usually fall off by this book, actually, if they're going to, and there's no shame in it. I totally get it. But this book is currently the biggest one in the series, and it is also the one that, like, most people get bored in this one. Although, I feel like there is plenty of opportunity in the books to get bored if you're not engaged. Like, this is a very long series. People know that. And this is the book that tends to drop people off. Um, as I've said many times, I love every book in this series, but there aren't, there isn't really anyone who would give the Fiery Cross their favorite position. I'm sure someone exists, right? Never make absolute statements, but I've never met that person who the Fiery Cross is their favorite book, right? It's usually book one or four or eight or one of those um, because we're at the point in the journey now 
um, for a good portion of it, in the next book included, where we're just doing a lot of living on the homestead. Jamie and his family are the center of, you know, Fraser's Ridge, and there is people that they brought to, you know, homestead with them, and now they're having to get involved in the war, but first they have to be on the British side, and they have to wait till just the right time to be able to switch over to the American side, like they're in a really tight position. And there's just a lot of dealing with a bit of the politics of it, as well as just trying to, they want to just be on their own. There are, you know, some life or death scenario, life or death scenarios we're going to run into for a couple characters in here. But to me, there's also still some very beautiful and important moments in this book. And if you want to know more about those, we'll be talking about them at book club, which when you're, when the public is seeing this video will be on Saturday, it will have already happened. So you can go check that out or hopefully uh, you will have been there with us and you'll know what we're talking about. But there's more to talk about with this book, obviously, than just like, was this boring or did you like it or not? Um, and that's what we discuss in book club, right? Like I've said from the beginning, this book club isn't about what people are going to rate the books. If you're looking to just read this for book club and then say, oh, it was a three star read, like don't come to book club. I'm just being honest. That's not why I'm there. I'm there to dive deep into this series with people. That is the only way that I was convinced that I wanted to do a book club for this and to help people be able to read it is you have to look at it as more than just like, okay, this was book five in a series. Was it better or worse than the one before it? Right? Anyway, we'll save that for book club to go into it. That's not me lecturing you about what you should take from it. I'm just saying that's what book club is for me. If you're just looking to read it and then you decide Diana Gabaldon has lost the plot, there's too much going on, I'm not into it. Well, the Outlander series was never quite the series for you anyway, because it's a, it's a life series. <laughs> like, literally, it's going to take a huge chunk of my life to read it. And it's, you know, it's a huge chunk of these characters' lives as well. So this isn't a series where each book has a beginning, middle, and end. And people can have a problem with that and say that's not how books are supposed to go. And I can say this is one of the most successful series that's ever existed in all time. So there's that. Okay, so for me, I don't really rate these anymore. So they're all either five or six stars to me. Like I don't really nitpick about how it felt. I did pull out the audiobook for this one because it is the biggest. And I had a lot of things that I was trying to get through at the same time I was working on my little book nook that I built, which I put up a vlog about that recently. And so Diana Porter, I think is her name, is the woman who does the narrating for it. And I mean, I love this series so much. So moving on, I listened to an ALC of The One I Didn't See Coming by Piper Rain, and this was narrated by Jason Clark and Ava Erickson, and I believe this was in duet style. Um, I got this from Valentine PR. This is book three in the Plain Daisy Ranch series, and this one is Emmett and Briar. And, oh, that's funny. I've read a couple books with the name Briar this, uh, this week. And this one is Briar is actually the younger sister of, uh, shoot, what's her name? Did I write it down? Oh, I didn't write it down. Um, but it's the heroine from book one who has like the son and that was a second chance romance. This is her younger sister. Now I talked about this in a Patreon vlog and I was vague in the review that I wrote because it appeared that the authors wanted people to be vague, but it also kind of pissed me off a little bit because one of the main tropes that this book is was not being advertised anywhere. And in the arc that I got in the beginning, they said, please don't spoil the reason why Emmett falls or the reason why Briar falls for Emmett. And I didn't see any of the author's promotional material, nor anyone else who was reading the series, none of them shared what one of the main tropes was. And as soon as I started the book, like literally I got three chapters in and I was like, this book has this trope. I'm going to tell you what it is in a second. I know I'm, I'm building suspense here, but I was like, oh my God, I love this trope. Okay. See, I was excited because I do love this trope. And then I was like, how did I miss this? So I went and looked at the promotional material on Piper Rain's page and all that. And no, nobody mentioned it anywhere. And I was like, how is this a secret? Like, how is it a secret? It's, it's literally in chapter three. Why are we not talking about it? So what this is, is this is a pregnancy book. It's a, it's a secret pregnancy, but it's not Emmett's baby. Okay. So Briar shows up at Plain Daisy Ranch and she's pregnant from her ex-boyfriend 
and she isn't necessarily on the run from the ex. We'll get into that a little bit. She just, well, I'll tell you, she found out she was the other woman. She found out she was the other woman with this guy she'd been seeing for a long time and she's pregnant and so she never told him and she goes to Plain Daisy Ranch and her sister helps her find a place to stay and she actually ends up living with Emmett. Now, she hates Emmett because of a situation which, though it was a misunderstanding, the thing that she misunderstood, I don't blame her for misunderstanding, so I'll say that, but because of that misunderstanding, she's hated him since they were young. Like, she used to have a crush on him because, you know, her sister liked his brother and so they were around each other a lot and he was a couple years older than her, but he really hurt her really hurt her feelings and so she hates him and now she's living in his house and she's being kind of a bitch about it but Emmett very soon on discovers she's pregnant again that's why I said I don't understand why this is a secret anywhere and I was getting really pissed off which I tried to take it down because I know people I know people have different feelings about what like if tropes are spoilers or not and I just I firmly believe no form of pregnancy should be a spoiler in a book. I just don't. Even when there's surprise pregnancies in the third act or they're whatever, people are very people are very sensitive about pregnancy and babies and they're allowed to be, right? I'm very sensitive to loss of a pregnancy or abortion or miscarriage or that. It very much affects me. So I like to know. Um, but the fact that it wasn't said anywhere that this was a not his baby, when again, it's one of my favorite tropes, I was getting really pissy. But because I read this as a PR, and I do promise not to spoil things in my review, and they chose to make that that it's a spoiler, I didn't feel that it was right for me to out that. But I'm telling you here in this, this is a not his baby, and I loved that about it. And I don't understand why it was kept as a secret. And, you know, someday I am planning to, like, I will update this review. And by someday, I'm not going to wait forever. Probably the end of the month, you know, now that their promotion is done and it's out there, I'm going to update my review and say this was a not his baby. But I'm just telling you, if you're an author watching this, like, don't hide tropes like that. I'm just saying. People can say they don't want to mark it by tropes, but you're missing the strength of it. There is a good good portion of us romance readers that will read because of a trope or will read despite what the trope is but we still deserve to know what it is okay so this is a pregnancy trope okay it's a it's a secret pregnancy but it's not Emmett's baby okay and he helps her keep this secret so though I was not upset that this was a that there's pregnancy I was upset we were hiding it and then I did get annoyed because Emmett figured out she's pregnant right away. This man who hasn't really been around a lot of pregnant women at all. I mean, she is staying with him, but like he find, he figures it out within a week of her staying with him. She's very early pregnant. Her sister who's had a baby doesn't realize it. Her friends don't realize it there. No one else realizes it until the third, like everything happens, but Emmett figures it out right away, okay? And I know that that is a convention in the story to make him be the one who's there for her, who helps her, who helps her through the tough pregnancy stuff. But the fact that nobody else figures it out, it makes them all look stupid. Because she's very, like, obvious about it in a lot of ways. The, the things that make Emmett realize it, other people should realize it too. So the believability factor of this was, of course, pretty rough. Which, again, I'm not always in romance for the believability factor. But I also don't like being treated like I'm stupid. So I ended up at a four star with this one. It was a three on the spice scale. And I do really enjoy this series. But I have been, like, I've liked the books kind of like... I don't know, the second one I liked the least because that was the Friends to Lovers where Jude was an absolute ass. And Jude is an ass in this one too. So really don't feel great about the second one. But I, I really enjoyed the first one. Didn't care for the second one. This one was okay. So I don't know. We are moving away from the Naughton Brothers with the next one. It's still going to be playing Daisy Ranch, but we're moving on to one of their cousins, I think, <clears throat> for our next one. So maybe I'll like that better when I meet like the other cousins. I don't know, but this series has just been kind of meh for me. So gave it four stars, three on the spice scale. And again, there's pregnancy in this book. Okay. And it was cute. It was great. Okay. I love it. All right. Then I read a book for the Phantom Romance Readathon, which again, all the books I read, I'm able to count for the readathon. 
but I have a few that are specifically on my Phantom TBR. So this one is called Unmasked by Colette Gale, and this is actually an erotic romance, and I had to buy the ebook for this. Luckily, I had a lot of, I always have a lot of credit saved up because I have to order a lot of books from Amazon for Patreon and my book boxes and stuff. So I was able to use credits to buy it because I think it was like 6 or seven ninety nine since it was a, I don't know, technically a traditionally published book. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this was a Phantom of the Opera retelling and it follows it pretty closely for like everyone has the same names as that, the way that it's set up and Christine and Eric, it's already like pretty sexual from the beginning. Like, um, she is very attracted to whoever her angel of music is. Um, though in the beginning she does think it is her father, as we said, um, there is sex in every chapter in this. It is erotic. And there is a villain in this one that I wasn't expecting who the villain would be. And though the, this is pretty much erotica, but it did end up with an HEA on the very last page. There's a lot of violent stuff in here. There was essay. There was threats of essay. There was no essay from Eric to Christine. Okay, there was other people who essay her. We also see other people's sexual exploits, including Carlotta. We see her sexual exploits at some places, as well as Madame Jury, who in this one is a super sexy MILF, as it were, and she's getting it on with the opera owners at different points and things. So this was just, it was wild. It was wild, but it got me a lot of points for the readathon. Um, but I did only give it a three star. Again, though, there did end up being some interesting plot near the end of this, but it almost read, I mean, it really read like a fan fiction that had gotten published, which that is what it is. It is. So yeah, there was essay and kidnapping. There was also masks, impact play. There were some MMF scenes. There was anal restraints. Like it's erotica with an HEA. We'll call it that. Okay, next up, I read an arc from Lillian Harris for Brutal Savage, and this is the next book in her Brutal, or Savage King series. Um, so this one was really interesting. This is Alara and T Tienen, I think so we say it, and Alara is a woman on the run, and she is currently a teacher, and Tienen, he has been made the guardian and adopted father of I think it's his cousin's kid, but he's called the dad the whole time and he really treats this boy like his son. And so he is a member of the Irish mafia, right? Like his dad is Patrick and Patrick is trying to push him into getting married because that's what Patrick does. That apparently is his sole aim with all of his children is make sure they all get married and he's very fucking pushy about it. Okay. Every book I'm irritated with Patrick because he's just trying to shove people into relationships that are never the right relationship. Patrick hasn't gotten it right a single fucking time, okay? Like, why Lillian? Why is Patrick like this? I I used to love Patrick, I really did. I liked Patrick way back in the books and I hate him now because he's so stupid, okay? This old man is so stupid. Okay, moving along. I like the book, I just, I hate Patrick. I'm so over Patrick, okay? Like he got his second marriage with the woman he actually loved fuck off old man and let the kids be left alone but because of this pressure that his father's trying to force him into getting married he decides to make his son's teacher marry him because he really likes her and he needs to get married and he's like i'm gonna force her into marrying me <laughs> so this is a forced marriage but he's so into her that like you don't mind it really and a lot of the reason she's resistant to him is because she is this woman on the run and she's scared of who's catching up to her to catch up to her because her ex-partner was very abusive. He beat her. He assaulted her. He forced her to be a drug mule. She almost died from being a drug mule at one point. So very icky life that she's run away from and everything. And Tienan, he's like, tell me, I will end this person. And she's like, I know you think there's a big tough Irish guy, but the guy I'm running from, he's really serious too. And we, the readers are like, how tough can this guy be? Right? We, the he's from a pretty dangerous place. So I do understand her hesitancy, even though she should have realized she's with the baddest alpha that there is, right? Super sexy. This book, of course, was very hot. There was some good, um, there's some somnophilia between them. There was uh, a pierced MMC. There was, I think, anal in this one as well. But yeah, it was very dark. There was kidnapping, domestic abuse, drug muling, and the surprise, the third act surprise in this one, 
I did not see it coming, I will say. So for all my bitching I just did like about Patrick and everything, I gave this one a four and a half star and it is like tied with my favorite Lillian Harris. I really liked this one. You could read this as a standalone if you want. I know people will ask because each one is about a different one of the kids getting married, but they stand pretty far alone. Like you can read it on its own. And it also had a really cute kid um, and a, a dog that gets adopted. Like there was lots of cute stuff in here for sure. Okay, then I read another book for the readathon called Music of the Night by Angela J. Ford. This was a Phantom of the Opera retelling with Aunt, with Aria and Uriah. And this one I did not care for like at all. I can barely tell you what it's about besides it was a retelling. I didn't like the writing style that was used or the way the words were chosen. And you guys know for me, if I notice how badly like that, it like it's bad because I don't, notice that stuff normally and it was very obvious in this one to me and I did not care for that I didn't care for it so I gave this one two stars it was one and a half on the spice scale but it's one of those that like I guess people thought this was YA and so there was lots of people in their reviews who were like this was so spicy this isn't for kids and well a grain it isn't for kids like it was not that spicy at all and I didn't care for the romance at all anyway so didn't care for it but again, it was worth a lot of points for the readathon, so I suffered through it. Okay, next up, I read Jade City by Fonda Lee. Um, I listened to the audio for this one. It was narrated by Andrew Kishinu. And this is a, like, it's not dystopian fantasy. It's like urban fantasy. Um, and there, and it's also like a mafia style um story uh, because there are these different factions of clans and they're able to use jade to have special powers basically okay and they are in charge of like there are these different families who battle against each other and are um the green bone warriors there are basically like two families that are kind of um fighting over things and there are like four call siblings in the beginning in the beginning and their family is kind of the most powerful but there's another um opposing family that is fighting against them for power and has been making some big moves and so at the beginning of the book we have lan who i'm basically going to call him like the boss at this time though their grandfather who was the previous boss is still alive he has dementia and he's barely still there anymore um which actually can make him very dangerous because he does still have his jade um which again is what you use for your power and someone who is within do, like think of charles xavier type thing right when like in logan right where he's losing his mind and he could really hurt people with it mm -hmm. possibility here with this grandfather right and so the jade i am totally butchering this of course because i'm doing a quick review of this but the jade it can be mined and you also and then it gets made refined down and it's made into jewelry and different pieces that people will hold and the more jade you have on your body the more like power you can absorb with it the more powerful you are um so the different families they all share in the mining and the producing of the jade and that's supposed to stay kind of neutral what's happening with that like no one's supposed to mess with that you can bicker and fight over stuff in other places but you're not supposed to fight over that right so that's one aspect um another way you get jade is you earn it by doing you know by moving up through the ranks within your clan and also if you have like battles one-on-one -on -one, if you when you defeat the person and kill them you take the jade that they have for yourself and you add it to them now there are a few different stipulations there are certain people that they are what we consider kind of like um they're called stone eyes and though they may be from a family who can handle jade they themselves are immune to it which means they can't use it but it also can't be used on them so they're this like anomaly that they are not able to control it, but they also can't, like, it can't hurt them. So they're very unique people. And then you also have people who they can get what's called the itches and they can get a jade sickness, which means they've reached their, the amount of jade that they're able to use to fight with. And then it becomes overwhelming to them and it starts to like hurt them and it can cause them crazy to like hurt themselves or whatever. It basically drives them mad. So 
you as someone who can control jade you do have a natural jade like tolerance where once you hit the highest level you have um it either then like you can't be any more powerful because it doesn't matter how much more jade you add to yourself you can't use any more of it or it could also tip you over and if you try to use more than you can you can go crazy so anyway that's just me trying to explain all these different little rules that you won't even understand until you start reading this anyway but the point being jade is the currency jade is the power those who control the most jade control that then we also have the normal as i said the normal things that would go on within like mafias battling each other you fighting for territory and blah 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 now this does still kind of take place in a you know modern ish like society but there are places that are completely controlled by the jade families as well but there still is like the regular world out there and they kind of leave these people to themselves to do the shit they want to do as long as they don't mess with things in other places so there there are um these like heads of families they deal with politics they deal with the you know leaders of cities and countries and stuff too and make deals with them and stuff like that so very complex there as this kind of says like you're introduced to these four, the four different siblings in this family who are all like in different places there's one sibling her name is shay who she actually left the family she took off all her jade she wanted to live as a normal and she went to college and all this stuff and we see her returning to the city at the beginning she wants to like start her life get a job we again have one of the siblings who is currently the leader and his right hand man is one of the other brothers we have lan and hilo and then we have a brother who he's basically adopted into the family his uh parents died when he was young his mother actually died of the itches as i said like she was driven crazy by jade and this adopted younger brother his name is uh oh his name just went out of my head andy Andy's what they call him. He has a different name, but like Andy is his nickname. And he's actually in like school right now learning how to use his jade. And once he completes it, he can become a member of, you know, he's, he'll get brought into the family and start playing in the, pol playing in the games as well. So there's a lot going on and this had a lot of heartbreaks in it. It had a lot of, as I said, the politics of gangs and the you know the leaders trying to vie for power there was betrayals there was just all those things in here so this there isn't any romance in this really at all like there's one of the one of the brothers who has a love interest in here but it's not about that at all this is more of like a family saga and I loved this okay i read this because big sis uh crystal crystal's bookish life this is one of her favorite series she's ever read she loved this whole series so i was supposed to be and i kind of was buddy reading this with jessen from jessen reads romance um while she was in scotland the past like couple weeks so we kind of were reading it at different times but we did talk about it when we were done with it and i plan to continue this series i will read jade war next month is the plan uh, because i did give this five stars i was hooked into it like i said we did buddy read it so that means like i read about 100 pages every day and i found myself when i would stop it i wanted to keep going because there's a lot you're having to learn and i don't want to forget any of it so that's why like i am going to continue very soon because i don't want to forget anything i do think that the audiobook was a good way to do it because there are a lot of names and things that i would not know how to pronounce and it's one of those series that like i'm glad i listened to it because I'm going to remember, like, I'm, I want to remember those things uh, and not wait too long to read it. So I gave this five stars and I was heartbroken by some of the things that happened. Um, I didn't, like, cry ugly tears yet. Uh, I think I could in the future because the people that are still left at the end of this, I'm pretty attached to them. And they're not in the steadiest place right this was only the end of book one and i know that crystals cried a lot when reading this series so i'm scared for what's going to happen but i will be continuing this series i don't think i'm buddy reading it anymore because i don't know that jessen wants to continue it but i sure shooting i'm going to be continuing it because i i really enjoyed it and i don't read much non-romance you guys know this i've only read like two other non-romance this whole year but I will keep reading that so that's a series that hooked me in for sure 
Okay, next up, I had another ALC, and this one was Sleeping with the Enemy by Deborah Garland. This is continuing the Astoria Royal series. Now, why I keep coming back to this series? Well, I really like the audiobooks. They are in duet style, and they have like a full cast almost. So like this one had Lexi Evans and Logan Anair, and then Troy Duran and Tyler Griffin made stops in again as well. And this one starts with, this had a kick-ass beginning though. I was really hooked into it. Then I got a little lost for a while, and the characters were very sex-focused. Before they even had sex, they were so focused on each other's bodies for the beginning half that I wasn't sure how I was going to like it. But then the second half of the book was really strong. And so I'll tell you, I did end at a four star with this series. We'll get into it, or with this book, we'll get into it. Um, and I thought it was really well done by that point. But the author almost lost me because they were very sexually focused for a good part of it. And I was like, we are in a dangerous situation. Can we stop? You know, I'm that type of person. But this book starts with Rorden. Um, and he's having a meeting with a, a with a Bratva member and this Bratva member happens to have one of his submissives with him like kneeling by him It's this really beautiful of course he noticed big titted Russian girl and uh, This is the Italian Mafia have a meeting with him and things go badly at this meeting and of course He has to notice how sexy this person is and that he would love to take her for a ride if the Russian would borrow her to him blah 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 so again already very much sexualizing this person a whole bunch well then there something goes wrong and this woman actually like throws herself in front of Jordan Rorden and she gets shot and so when they're booking it out of there he takes this woman with him even those people are like leave her she's a russian slut and it's like she threw herself in front of a bullet we're not gonna leave her so he brings her home with him and gets his doctor who goes about working on her she was shot and very quickly he discovers that this isn't this russian girl named pasha or sasha whatever name she's going by but her name is actually priscilla and rorden actually knows her though he hasn't seen her in 17 years because she is actually Irish. It's the Irish, not the Italian. Sorry. She's actually Irish and she is the daughter of uh, an old uh, lieutenant who I believe he had actually died. And she had actually been raped 17 years ago. And Rorden, he had actually liked her, but he was 20. 1 22 and she was only 17 so he wasn't gonna make a move on her he was actually waiting for her to be old enough because he did want to be with her but she made a move on him when he was drunk and she was only 17 and so he had to like put a kibosh on that and then she like ran away from him and when she runs away she ended up getting raped he came in rescued her killed the men who were raping her um but then she disappeared and he never saw her again and though at different times he'd like looked for her he couldn't find her and yeah, he just didn't know what happened. Well, now here this woman is and she's an undercover FBI agent. And the reason she was dressed like a Russian slut is because she'd went undercover because it's the Russians who actually raped her when she was young. And she's wanting to take that down. So this puts Rorden in a very tricky position. He's happy he found Priscilla after all these years. He obviously is very sexually attracted to her because again, that's all his dick is fucking thinking about is her um, and her fake tits that she got put on so that she could win over this Russian or whatever. Like the amount of times her fake perky tits are talked about. You guys know how that just grates. It's a cheese grater on my nerves, but, um, but also she's an FBI agent. So he's like, not only was she like undercover with Russians, who I don't trust the Russians, she's also working with the FBI, which, you know, we're criminals, not a great mix. But he gets it into his head that he wants to get revenge against the Russian. And so he's going to force her to marry him, making the Russian think that he flipped his plaything to be on his side. And she's like, you can't do this. I need to get back in with the Russians. I left evidence there to take down the Russians. And he's like, no, I'm never letting you go again. So that is the position that they're in. So as I said, didn't really like the first half of this when he's like, oh, it would be so great to finally fuck Priscilla who I'd wanted before, but I couldn't have her. And all this horrible thing happened to her. And, and where did she go? And just all of these things, right? There was so much uh, flashbacks to when they were young and what she's been through and just all of these things. It just got very tiring. But the second half of this 
like it was pretty strong there but oh, there was a lot of frustration as well so this was an ALC so I ended up giving it a four star it was a three on the spice scale there also was this I forgot I'm glad I made a note of this um, there was a pegging scene in this one because while they are fake married for a while um, he like reads some of her romance novels and they try a couple things in one of her books and he really wants to do anal with her and she's totally interested she's into it and she's like would you ever let me do this to you um, I think it'd be really hot and like he actually agrees to it and they don't end up having time to do it then but before the end of this book he does actually let her peg him and he fucking likes it so that actually gave this a whole other half star for me that this tough Irish gangster was willing to get pegged because there's not very many guys that would admit that in, in a in a mafia romance and I was here for it so not my favorite in the series but also I've had a rough time with the books of the series but I keep reading them because I like the audiobooks and also I like getting an ALC of it because then I don't have to buy it in case I don't like it so that's where we're at with it so yeah give four stars a three on the spice scale okay next up I had a physical art of truly madly deeply by LJ Shen there's a pretty little artwork piece here thank you so much to bloom for sending this to me absolutely I was nervous about this book but I did sign up for the arc when I had the opportunity just because I wanted to give it a go I was like I wonder what one of her traditionally published books would be like I would love to check that out and so I did with this one and this book was a freaking ride everybody it absolutely was there's so much that goes into this one um, I'm actually not gonna tell just everything about this one because I'm just not this video is gonna be so long and this isn't the best book that I read this week okay it's not but I found it very fascinating it has an absolute dick of a hero but it's one of those that his assholeriness is 95% protection and he is what I call that type of feral golden retriever. Like he's spitting all these things out constantly of just like these awful things they sound, but he would crawl over broken glass for this heroine. And he hates himself that he would do that because he feels very betrayed by her based on a scenario in the beginning. So this is a best friend's brother or what turns out to be ex best friend's brother because in the, the prologue of this, um, our heroine and the hero actually get caught having sex by the best friend and she disowns her friend for doing this she's so pissed off and then so that happened and she hasn't spoken to this friend and now I think it's four years later I think it's four years later um, her dad has died and she's back in their small town because her dad has died yeah five years later and now she's faced with both the man that she like really hurt his feelings that night as well as the ex best friend and now like they become friends again and they forgive and um, the hero is like no way in hell am I gonna be with this girl again but he's so drawn to her he like can't help himself even though he knows that she's gonna hurt him again they're both only supposed to be in town for a short amount of time he is a celebrity chef he starts this restaurant in this town um, and he's planning to actually sell some land that he bought to a development to put in this like hotel mall and everything there. And the people in town just absolutely hate that he's doing that. So there's also some stalking and like um, threatening that's happening to him. Like his tires are getting slashed. His business gets trashed one time. And the people in town like don't believe this, but he really is selling that land to someone to help the town because it would bring so many tourists into their town if they did that and they just refuse to see it so there's also him being like why am I trying to help this fucking town anyway there's a lot of trauma in both of their backgrounds him from domestic abuse in his family and her from something that I won't spoil it but it was extremely traumatic case of bullying that happened to her not by the hero no 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 by girls actually I will say um and so these two they've just been so broken and neither the the other one like didn't know what the other one went through and as we get as we unravel that and we get towards it I was just I really wanted these two to be able to figure it out so bad so there's Cal is our heroine Ro 
or Ambrose is the hero. And this was a fucked up book in a lot of ways. This isn't, I'm sorry, I know LJ Jen's trying to sell this as like a dark rom-com. And like there are some funny things, but like this, this wasn't a rom-com to me at all. Like it was, it was pretty deep. It was pretty heavy. But by the end of it, like I liked it. And I just felt their HEA so deeply. I was so happy they had an HEA at the end. And that tells me that I did make it through this story. But I don't think most people will love this. I don't think they will. Um, again, I'm not the biggest LJ Shen fan. And I didn't have super high expectations for this. But I wanted to try to read it since they had given me this copy of it. And by the end of it, I'm glad I was. Because I gave it four stars. And it was a three on the spice scale. We had some fun spicy things that showed up. There was anal. There was some hot face sitting scene okay I'm telling you it was hot there was food usage during sex and there was double penetration uh with the toy used so that was hot now the trigger warnings for this are numerous okay as I said there was child abuse bullying sexual harassment child exploitation violence against teenagers cyberbullying, mentions of an overdose androphobia which is a fear of men apparently um, attempted murder and domestic abuse. So like there's a lot in this one, everybody. So be prepared. Okay. The light is coming for me. We got to keep pushing. Okay. So then I read Hooked on You by Nikki Ash. This was such a sweet book. Okay. This was a double single parent. This is one of my most anticipated books for this month, actually. And it did live up to it quite well. I was sent a physical, um, early copy of this one from Nikki Ash and I was so happy to have it because yeah this one was a billionaire uh, it was a struggling single mom again single dad as well she becomes a caregiver for his daughter so first she's a caregiver at the workplace because she ends up as like a working at a daycare at their job and then eventually when Ryder discovers that she doesn't have a place to live her and her daughter when he discovers that her and her daughter are actually living in their car, he makes her a live-in nanny, moves her into his house to take care of his daughter because by then he trusts her pretty well. So I really enjoyed this one. Um, this is also a woman on the run. That's also part of the reason she is living in her car. And this was one of them just like, it wasn't like insta love because they're not like in the love from the beginning, but there also is just like, they connected so well. Um, he as soon as he's sure he wants her, he doesn't, as my dad would say, he doesn't pussyfoot around. He is like, you are the one for me. I love your daughter. I love you. You're here. Like we're together. There's no question to me. And so though it could be weird because of the power dynamic, he of course gives her so much choice. He gives her so much space to choose him. Um, but the way that he treats her and her daughter, like there's just no other option. Absolutely. So the only like drama of this definitely comes from outside. Um, there is drama from both of their exes in the third act of this one, but not in the drama that like is splitting them up. Okay. Like it's, it's drama from both of their exes, but not them messing with his relationship. So yeah, I gave this one four and a half stars. I took half a star off because it's so cheesy. I'm just warning you, this is very cheesy in the romance side of it. Um, but I love it. This is another hero who reads romance novels. He's actually in a romance book club, which we love to see it. Um, so that was beautiful, but yeah, it was, it was, it was good. So trigger warnings, domestic abuse, danger to a child and child abandonment in this one. Okay, still got some more arcs to go. We're keeping it going. There was Born for Silk by Nikki Harris. This one just came out. This is a dystopian um, hero is an altered humanoid. Um, well, not human. Like, he is human, but he's, like, altered. Um, bit of a Handmaid's Tale type thing, but also it appears to be gentler how they treat the women, but still the point is that she's supposed to make babies for the people. So there are only certain women anymore who are able to fully carry babies, right? We've seen that type of thing. And so there are these girls called silk girls who their genetics have proven to their line is able to have children pretty safely and well. And also, as I've mentioned, there are altered humans, as in like our hero Rome is an altered human. And this like line of females, their bodies seem the best adapted to be able to hold 
an altered baby, right? Because the genetically these babies are like bigger and um, sometimes the women as early as like 20 weeks, they'll have to have the baby removed and put it in an artificial womb so that they don't like wreck the girl basically. Um, and so we have our heroine Aster who's being raised to be a silk girl and not too far into this book, she gets brought um, to our heroes like I don't know what to call it his it's not his city like his compound to be possibly chosen as his silk girl now the way that this part is done is because um there's lots of threats to um the king so because he's also the king so he's our king um there would be lots of threats on whoever his child was the way that the, he gets an heir is that there is a collective of girls, like four to five, who are brought, and he has other of his men who've been chosen to father a child. And the women are each in their own room, and they have a veil, like, over their face, right? So they can't see or be seen. Um, and each of the men are, like, with one of these women. And so the women don't know which man impregnates them. So they don't know if they're holding the king's baby. And if they have the king's baby, any one of them could be the one that's pregnant with it. So it's supposed to make it so that they're safer, I guess, because any one of them could have the heir. Anyway, so then, you know, when you do have a baby, of course your baby's taken away from you to be raised by like a, I don't know, I'm gonna call her a den mother, whatever she's called. Um, so you don't get to raise your own baby, you don't get to stay with them at all, you are just there to be a womb basically, but you're going to be treated really well, and then get fucked by one of these random men, okay? So that's kind of what the setup is supposed to be. Like, of course it's not nice, but I mean, it doesn't, I don't know, parts of it don't feel as scary as other things, but now the outside world is still a dystopian world. There are still places where people do try to live on their own um, without the protections of you know, I can't remember what it's called without the protections of like the state or whatever. And they don't fare well because there are these groups of roaming bad guys who I think some of them are also altered. I don't know, but they've become cannibals. So if you are living somewhere that is not under the protection of the state and you've not been put into their programs to be one of their like workers or whatever, they aren't necessarily warring against those people, right? Like the state doesn't have the, you know, want or need to attack them but they also don't help them and so these people get attacked by these like groups of cannibals and this scary stuff happens to them um and yeah it's pretty terrifying and the way that our little silk girl aster actually ended up with the people to begin with is there was a group of like normals who they met up with like the king and so he was very young at this time too the king wasn't that old then and they gave some of their children to them because they were like, they're from a line of altered people um, and we're, we don't want to lose them, um, so you take them. So that is how Aster actually ended up where she was, is that she was from a group of normals who they gave her up because they hoped that she would have a better life and be better protected. Now, when Aster and Rome meet, when she gets brought to be possibly chosen as part of the collective for the king, he instantly feels an attraction to her and though he tries to fight it it's very clear that um she's the one he wants so in my opinion there is a bit of a faded mate aspect there just has to be for how it goes but anyway this was super hot it's a size difference he's over seven feet and i believe she's like five two or something his dick is literally like this high up in her he can't use his whole dick in her like it's that kind of size difference thing um he has a magic eagle friend who we love seeing him around. Odio, is that his name? But I don't know. I know it's super confusing everything I explained, but if you like dystopian, if you like Handmaid's Tale vibes, if you like size difference, if you like if you like big, powerful hero who's just super soft and sweet for her, um, you'll like this. I loved it. I gave it five stars. I also will say, I thought this was, because there's three of books that were announced in this series, and I thought this was maybe going to have a cliffhanger and be their story continued, but it is not. There's an HEA for Rome and Aster in this book, and there is two more books. There's gonna be Born for Marble and Born for, I don't remember what the third one is, um, but that's gonna be different couples, and we kind of get a clue of who those couples will be in this one. So you can read this one 
as a standalone to check it out and see if you like it. Um, I thought it was balanced pretty good for this whole world you had to explain to us and I did have a good feel for the world by the end even though I'm not doing too well articulating it to you. I thought that that was done very well and I appreciated it for sure. So I gave it five stars. It's a uh, four on the spice scale and there is trigger warnings for cannibalism, for sterilization, gore, violence, power imbalance, and harm to animals. So be prepared for that. Okay, next up, I had a DNF, so I won't talk about it too much. I didn't hate this book at all. It was Hockey Boy by Brittany Nicole. This was one of the arcs I was supposed to read this month. After reading some super, like, heavy-hitting books right before this, um, or not even heavy-hitting, but just, like, I was really liking them, I just could not catch in this book. Um, so I'm not even going to go into it because I didn't finish it, so I don't want to say anything. I only read, like, 70 pages. I wasn't hating anything. I just wasn't in the mood for this book. It just wasn't working for me. So I was like, I'm just going to hop out of it. So I did uh, email the PR company and I said, I'm going to DNF this. Sorry, count me out for that one. All right. Then I have the ALC of All Too Well by Corinne Michaels. This comes out on, I think the 18th or the 20th. It comes soon. It's not too much longer. And I'm a part of Corinne Michaels uh, art team now. So I got an ALC of this one. It was narrated by Connor Craze and Vanessa Edwin. And this was a brother's best friend, small town, uh, firefighter hero, single dad. And this is Ainsley and Lachlan. Now Lachlan, he is a fire chief in this small town and he also is an ex uh, football player and Ainsley who lives in New York and is a journalist gets assigned to write an article about him. Um, I won't go into all the details about that. So she's supposed to go back to her small town and write an article about him that could hopefully launch her career. And Lachlan and Ainsley, they both pine for each other. There was a time five years ago when his mother died. Um, and again, he's a single dad. He has a little girl. That little girl, I think, was only a year old at that time. And she made a move on him. She tried to kiss him. He was drunk. He pushed her away because he's like, oh my God, I could ruin everything. But it was kind of dumb of him to maybe push her away uh, because she then like ran away and has never been back home since then. And so when she's forced to see him and talk to him for this article, she has to try to find a way to, you know, get him to help her with this article and he's also still trying to keep her at arm's length from him because she's not planning to stay very long and yeah so there was mutual pining involved there was single dadding involved there was firefighting involved and a whole town of people who want them to be together so we'll just say that um i liked this a lot it was a four and a half star it was a three on the spice scale I really loved how the third act was handled with this one. So yeah, it was a good read. Okay, then I read Trail of Sunflowers by Tanya Fisher. This was a historical romance. This was one that it came out at the end of August. I just didn't get to it before now. Um, but this was an arc that I was sent from Tanya who, um, this is her third historical. They are Westerns. They are so good. They're so well done. Um, there, It starts with Letters to Dogwood and then there's poppies and silk which I adored and then this one trail of sunflowers is about junior and Issa and this one I believe takes place about five years after the last five to seven years after the last one and Issa is the younger sister of soul who is junior's best friend junior is also the younger brother of Ben who's the hero from the first book so it's the hero from the first book's younger brother and the hero from the second book's younger sister and he's been gone for a while he's been a texas ranger he's been in jail for like manslaughter at one point and he's on his way back um and he ends up picking up isa he meets her to travel with her back to the hometown i can't remember where she was but she had like went to college she's all grown up now and she used to be very much a tomboy when she was younger um, and it actually wasn't until her sister-in-law became a part of her life, again, in the last book, that she started dressing like a girl. Um, and Junior always kind of had a little thing for her, but he's a good amount older than her, so he was never going to make a move on her. She was panting after him when they were young, as it was, and he would just, he really, like, teased her a lot, kept her at arm's length. Again, as he should, because he was a good bit older than her. Though this is historical romance, so it wouldn't have been as looked down upon if, like, a 20 uh, 20 
to 23 year old like to 17 year old it just wouldn't have been as looked as looked down upon it wouldn't have um but anyway she's now educated and she wants to travel the world and he's headed back to the hometown and uh yeah so the first half of this is a road trip of them together and they bicker the whole way okay it took me quite a few days to get through the first half of this book too that's part of the reason i only just finished it this week is there was just so much bickering and i just didn't know if i wanted to keep going but i wanted to give this a full shot um, and once I finished it, like it was very good. And I really liked how the ATA was in this one. It was really beautiful. Um, and yeah, but yeah, this is a, a brother's best friend and you know, there's going to be drama to deal with, with that. And also our hero has some trauma and also the heroine said she never wants to get married. So, uh, there's, there's that kind of drama between the two, but this was great. It was sweet. I love this couple. And I gave this one four stars, and it was a three on the spice scale. It did get pretty spicy. It was good. Okay, then I listened to an ALC of Sweet Collide by Ava Harrison. This was actually my first Ava Harrison that I read, and this was, this was pretty interesting. <clears throat> this one was a hidden identity, fake dating, hockey romance. It was narrated by Christian Fox and Angelina Roca. And it starts with our heroine, Cassidy who she actually knows who Aiden is and Aiden this hockey player he and her actually grew up in the same trailer park he's quite a bit older than her and when they were young she was just I think she was only 13 um, they both had alcoholic parents he had an alcoholic mother she had an alcoholic father and they would meet by this lake behind their trailer houses and talking again he was 18 she was 13 there wasn't anything inappropriate there wasn't they were friends um and his mother was like determined to like keep him in this small town taking care of him and all this stuff he was a hockey player and his mother like didn't want him to go to college like there's just there's a lot to do with it but his mother stole money from him and so he wasn't going to have enough money to go to an exhibition game where he would hopefully get you know seen by some coaches and our heroine though she again is only 13 she had enough money saved up and she gives it to him at, and he's able to get a bus ticket and go to this and from that he ends up getting a scholarship he ends up like all these things and so now I can't remember how many years they tell us it's like 10 or 15 years later it's a good amount later right she's an adult and she sees that so she's staying with a friend in the city and she sees that he is at a hotel nearby um after a game and she really wants to see him and her friend convinces her to go do it so she's a little bit tipsy and she walks to this hotel now there's no way in hell she's going to be able to go in there. Like he's a famous hockey player and she'll look like a puck bunny trying to sneak into his place. But it just so happens at the same time that she's making her way there. Aiden has agreed to meet with this woman for some uh, sexy time who she's not a puck bunny and she's not a prostitute, but she's into BDSM and is willing to uh, have sexy time with him. And so she gets mistaken for this woman and instead of her correcting what's going on she just goes has and has sex with Aiden and it's fantastic now Aiden he has OCD it's very serious he has some trauma and he has some issues going on and so she always knew about that when she was like when she was little she knew about that and so she sees him dealing with this and um, he is embarrassed about what he's seeing happen that he's doing his like rituals and stuff in front of this stranger and she doesn't judge him she doesn't say anything and he feels very calmed by her so this causes him to make a wild ask and ask her if she would be his assistant and help him handle his issues and anyway we won't go through all the details but she agrees doesn't tell him who she is and starts becoming his fake girlfriend she's really his assistant but he's like people would think that's weird um and so be my girlfriend instead and so she's keeping this secret the whole time. And yeah, 
So there's a lot that's going to come out. There was a lot of flashbacks. I will say I don't think the way the flashbacks were put in was handled very well, especially as someone who's listening. I wasn't reading along with this. I was listening. It would go into flashbacks with no warning. I'm not saying with this one that the flashbacks weren't warranted. Sometimes I hate flashbacks altogether, but there was no indication we were going into it. Now, if you were reading the book, the book goes from regular text to italicized text to show that we are in a flashback. When you are listening to this book, you cannot hear that. So I'm listening and let's say working on my cross stitch as I do. And all of a sudden I feel like I'm lost and now we're in the past and I have no indication because there isn't a like 15 years ago or anything. I would have no idea. It was very disorienting. And there was often times where I'd have to stop, pull up the ebook, see where we're at or whatever. So when I write my review, I'm definitely going to critique that. That only works if you're reading a physical copy of it. When you're listening to it, you have no idea you've just went into a flashback. And if you're not paying attention at every second, you wouldn't know. And I didn't care for that. It made for a disjointed thing. Now, there were so many miscommunications in this. You know, I understood where her lie came from. That was fine. Honestly, I was okay with it. But there were so many miscommunications through the whole damn book. And then there's also drama from their past and all of these things. So it was, it was, it was heavy. So I gave this a three and a half, rounded up to a four. Since it was an ALC, the performances are pretty good. Um, but yeah, this was a lot. So there was attempted essay in here, trauma, neglectful parents, and OCD was in this one. Okay, last book I read um, was Untouched by Anna Campbell. Now this was a very unique historical romance. I read this one for the readathon because it was a gothic one. Um, and this is my first Anna Campbell. And this book is about this woman named Grace who wakes up and she's been taken prisoner. She is tied up, she's gagged, she's been drugged. Um, and when she like fully awakes, she's tied up in this house on this estate, doesn't know how she got there. Then we have Matthew, who is immediately very suspicious of this woman, and we don't understand why he's being kind of like, he's not being cruel to her, but she's like, can you untie me? And he's like, no. She like throws up from the laudanum, and he like, he gives her a bowl, but otherwise doesn't really help her with anything. And we don't understand why she's in this position. There was these two men who kidnapped her. They're very creepy and weird, and they put her in this house. But I'll explain to you what's going on to her. So Matthew, our sweet hero in here, he's 25 years old, for the last 11 years, his uncle, who is his guardian, um, who became his guardian when he was 14, had him declared mad. And instead of putting him in an asylum where he'd be cared for by doctors and someone maybe would have figured out that he wasn't mad, his uncle has kept him on this very small estate in this small house with only him and his dog. Um, and his roses. He's also like a, is horticulturist what it's called? I don't know. Um, he grows his roses and different plants and stuff, but he's been kept prisoner. The uncle won't kill him because if he kills him, the uncle isn't the heir. Um, M Matthew is the heir, but the next heir behind him is a cousin in a different part of the family. So if the uncle were to kill Matthew, he would no longer have control over his estate or whatever. So why is Grace here? Grace is here because the uncle decides he wants Matthew to stop trying to escape. He also may suspect that Matthew may want to self-exit at some point in here because that's the thing. That's the only control Matthew has is like if he were to get rid of himself, that would be his ultimate revenge against his uncle and he doesn't have another reason to live. So the uncle has snatched this woman who the men who kidnapped her on behest of the uncle thought she was a prostitute because of how she was dressed, which she has a whole, we won't get into her whole backstory, but she's a widow. She's been um, separated from her family because of who she had married. Now her husband is dead. And so she's in a tough spot and she doesn't look the most put together. And she got kidnapped because they thought she was a prostitute. She is not. Um, and Matthew hates her because he thinks she's working with his uncle and is like playing dumb. Um, and she has no way to get out of here. And if my, if Matthew doesn't want her, if he doesn't want to have sex with her and have her be his mistress, 
then the uncle doesn't have any use for her. So that puts her in a very tough position and it puts Matthew in a very tough position. And so call me intrigued, okay? I don't wanna spoil anything about this book because I think you should read it. It was fascinating. This book kind of rode the line between an old school romance and I mean, I wouldn't call it a modern one by any means, but I've never read a book quite like this one before, okay? There was a lot of heavy stuff in here. There is, as I've already mentioned, like mention of self-exit. There is essay, there's forced imprisonment, abuse, torture, harm to an animal. Like there is a lot of dark things in here. And that's why I was like, it rides the line of things you'd see in an old school romance that are in it. But yet there was super powerful moments in here. And the way that they get an HEA was so good you guys like you know of course they end up falling in love which again is like what the uncle wanted because now he can use grace as leverage and now you know Matthew has lost some of the leverage he did have because now he's trying to protect this woman when he can't even protect himself um, and I really didn't know how they were gonna get an HEA for this and the sacrifices that they both make to, to get them out of this situation. It was really tough to read, but I was really compelled by them. I really was. Um, they were also so sexy together. Um, so Matthew is a virgin, obviously. He'd been trapped there since he was 14. She was married, but her husband is a lot older than her. Also, he had a really small dick, which we'll find out. So the first time her and Matthew are together is very like bad for her, right? He thinks this is a revelation of like, oh my God, this is what I've been missing about women and like, oh my God. And he doesn't take very good care of her. And she's never had satisfying sex before. So she just assumes that, oh, now I'm gonna have unsatisfying sex with Matthew. Plus he has a bigger dick than my husband. So now it hurts even more. Uh, so Matthew has to make that right for her pretty quickly. He needs to figure out a way to make that right for her. But I just, I enjoyed this book a lot. There are some issues with it. It wasn't perfect, but I, again, I thought it was really unique and it's that kind of historical where like, I've never read anything like it, so it's going to be stuck in my head for quite a while. So I gave it four stars. It's a two and a half on the spice scale. And again, lots of dark moments in it. So my throat is about ready to give up on me and I still have more videos to film. So we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you so much. Um, thank you to my new patrons and all my patrons and channel members. You're amazing. Um, make sure you check out the Etsy shop, which I'll have listed down below if you want to get your spooky uh, bookish merch there and we'll see you in the next video bye